Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the International Center for Sustainable Carbon. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, sustainable-carbon.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration on the website. Please type any questions you have in the questions box as we go along and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. The subject for today's webinar is Gas Separation Technologies for Energy Production, presented by Greg Kelsall. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Benedicta. So yes, I'll talk about gas separation technologies um, specifically focused on oxygen production. So in terms of the, the content for today, I'll talk about the importance of air separation units, looking at the, the market for oxygen and the uses of oxygen, look at the different air separation unit technologies and what the opportunities to develop them are, Take a look at some recent patent um, developments that have that have occurred over the last five years to get a feel for the, the direction of development of air separation units, and then finish off with some key messages. So in terms of the, the oxygen market, uh, looking at the, the overall industrial gases market, this was valued at around $96 billion in 2022. As you can see from this chart, that's largely um, based on North America, Europe and Asia, which together account for around 65% of that industrial gases market. In terms of oxygen itself, the, the level of oxygen production was around 380 million tonnes in 2018, which corresponds to a value of around $48 billion. And this is forecast to grow, um, perhaps as high as 50 to $65 billion currently, um, although I don't have um, public domain figures for that yet, growing at a compound annual growth rate of around 7 to 8%. separation unit and oxygen is particularly important in China um, due to the, the dominance of China in industrial manufacture. So ASU, for example, represents 14% of power use in the iron and steel industry in China. And this accounts for around 5% of the total national electric electricity production in China um, is due to air separation units. ASUs are typically located close to the point of use, largely due to the cost of oxygen transport, as well as the significant opportunities for heat integration of ASU with local um, industrial and power uses. And this results in a relatively large number of original equipment manufacturers for air separation units. In terms of the, the applications of oxygen then, even leaving aside medical oxygen, um, which is a large use, but at relatively small scales of oxygen production. The main uses for, for industrial oxygen are power generation, which I'll, I'll come on to in my next slide, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and the petroleum industry, where oxygen is a, a, a raw material for things like ethylene oxide um, to enhance the catalytic cracking of um, um, petrochemicals in refinery plant to produce more product and generally as an, a, a source of oxygen enriched combustion across a, a number of chemical processes. In glass and ceramics industry it's used in oxyfuel applications to achieve higher boiler efficiencies. In metal industries so in, in iron and steel it's used for oxygen enrichment in blast furnaces as well as a number of steps right through the, the metal manufacturing process not just for, for iron, but also for copper and, and aluminium. And in pulp and paper manufacture. So again, for um, enhanced combustion, but also as an, an alternative bleaching chemical to the use of chlorine. 
power generation then um, as power generation moves towards net zero emissions and we think about how fossil fuels can um, be part of that journey post combustion capture oxy combustion and pre combustion are the, the three kind of technology approaches to achieve that and the latter two of those both require oxygen so oxy, oxy combustion where the, the fuel is burnt in, in oxygen. So by eliminating the nitrogen, it then makes the, the subsequent capture of CO2 following condensation of the fuel gas relatively simple. And examples of, of use of oxy combustion are the, the K-Lide project in Australia, which I, I showed on the last slide, and the um, alum cycle where there's a current demonstrator in Laporte in Texas at 50 megawatts thermal scale. And NetPower are already thinking about feed studies for 300 megawatts um, commercial power plants based on the, on the oxy fuel process uh, at a number of global locations. Second approach needing oxygen is pre-combustion, uh, where we think about gasification of solid fuels and um, steam methane reforming of natural gas. So here the, the process produces syngas, rich in hydrogen, carbon monoxide and CO2. So following a water, water gas shift reaction to convert more of that um, um, CO, to hydrogen and CO2, the CO2 can then be removed in a, a pre-capture uh, process. And examples here are the, the 265 megawatt uh, green gem project in Tianjin in China, although this doesn't have CO2 capture uh, just yet. Sinopec Kulu, also in China, uh, which gasifies coal uh, to produce a range of chemicals. And that, that's recently had a, a, a one megaton um, CO2 capture facility installed. And then the Great, the Great Plains project in North America, uh, which gasifies coal to produce um, fertilizers and takes the captured CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in Canada. So looking now at the, the different ASU oxygen production technologies themselves, I'll start with um, cryogenic ASU. So this is the most established process for producing air, having first been established in, in 1895. It's capable of producing high volumes of oxygen at around 5,000 to 6,000 tons of oxygen per day in a single stream process, as well as producing oxygen over pretty much any purity that's needed right the way through to, to in excess of 99.99% purity. It's a technique based on the different boiling points of the constituents of air. So what oxygen boils at minus 183 degrees C, nitrogen at minus 196 degrees C, and argon at an intermediate temperature of minus 186 degrees C. So to achieve this, um, clearly the air needs to be liquefied, and that's typically achieved by um, cooling the air to minus 172 degrees C by operating the system at around six bar pressure, and then carrying out that rectification or distillation process. The process itself, um, there are many different configurations depending on the amount of liquid and gaseous products, the different um, productions of oxygen and nitrogen and argon and, and combinations of those. But typically it's um, a two power, a two tower process comprising the following steps of filtration to remove dust and other impurities, a compression step where the air is compressed and the water condensed out in interstage coolers, contaminants removal, to then remove any remaining water vapor, hydrocarbons and carbon dioxide, which could freeze and block the cryogenic equipment. The heat exchange process, where the air is passed through integrated heat exchangers and cooled using products and waste cryogenic streams to produce liquid air enriched in oxygen and nitrogen. 
and this happens in the two separate low and high pressure distillation columns um, as you can see in the tower they're separated by the condenser reboiler product compression where oxygen is then compressed at the pre prescribed pressure and then finally storage where the liquid oxygen produced from the su is stored in cryogenic insulated tanks ASU is a very energy intensive process. The energy demand for that process has been reduced significantly from around um, 500 kilowatt hours per tonne of oxygen produced around 50 years ago to current values of around 200 kilowatt hours per tonne. And that was largely done um, through increasing the scale of the cryogenic system and increasing scale clearly um, reduces the surface area per volume in that cold refrigeration process and, and therefore uh, reduces that cold energy loss. The efficiency can be increased by reducing the oxygen purity of the, the oxygen product. So thinking about um, oxyfuel systems, they typically need or, or, or can be optimized to oxygen purity of around 95 to 97%. So reducing the oxygen purity to 95% means that we don't have to separate the argon from the oxygen, um, which increases the efficiency of the ASU, but then moves the, the separation duty onto the, um, to the oxyfuel system and its carbon uh, capture unit. So there's an optimization to be done there. The theoretical minimum for a cryogenic ASU system is around 50 kilowatt hours per tonne of oxygen. So clearly there's some, some scope for improvement. Although if you look at the shape of the curve, it, it's flattening off, which um, kind of reflects the, the uh, maturity of, of these kind of cryogenic systems. But still there's opportunity for further development and the medium term target for oxyfuel uh, cryogenic systems has been set by the zero emission technology platform uh, at around 120 kilowatt hours per tonne of oxygen. The areas of um, the areas where we can achieve that reduction are primarily in the the main air compressor and the um, distillation system of the cryogenic process. So you can see from this chart that those two areas are where the, the highest exergy losses are. So advances in ASU have op tries to optimize um, that loss of exergy loss, both by technological advances in equipment, so reducing uh, pressure losses, for example, by designing increasingly complex distillation systems and processes to best integrate um, the systems and, and to minimize exergy loss. So a couple of recent examples of, of how that's been achieved are um, shown here. So the first one is to replace the dual Thompson valve um, for expansion of the oxygen product and, and generation of cold heat, and replacing that with a turbine expander. So these have been used quite extensively in, in recent times in liquid natural gas processes. Um, where they, they can achieve near isentropic expansion. So using that um, either a liquid expander or ideally a two-phase expander in air separation units can achieve a potential um, reduction of 15 kilowatt hours per tonne. A further example is integration of the ASU system with an organic rank, ranking cycle. So this takes the, the heat of compression from the interstage um, compressors and uses that heat um, to heat a refrigerant, which can then be used for electrical generation. Whilst components uh, and process improvements can be achieved, I think probably the, the main focus of air separation unit improvement is through heat integration. But clearly this is, is highly specific to a particular application and, and a site. So rather like the um, 
rather like this, the system of, of integration with ORC that I've just described, we could think about integrating the ASU with the, the steam cycle of the, the octafuel system, for example. So using that um, intercooler heat to heat uh, boiler feed water um, within the octafuel system. Or in the alum cycle case, it could be used to, to heat the recycled CO2 stream. And that integration can drive the, the, the um, energy of um, oxygen production to 150 kilo hours per tonne of oxygen and below. Another thing we can think about with, with um, cryogenic air separation unit systems is the flexibility of the system. Power generation systems uh, and fossil fuel based power generation systems, which are fully dispatchable, can be used to stabilize grids where we see increasing penetration of um, renewables, so specifically um, solar and wind. But they need to be flexible. So that means that the, the oxygen production unit uses in those net zero power systems also needs to be flexible. And that can be achieved as has as been shown in a recent um, Chinese study where the, the oxygen system, the air separation unit um, can operate flexibly with 10% minimum, sorry, 10% power load change per minute being achieved down to 40% power load. Clearly, um, ASUs play a significant role in China, as I've described earlier, where they account for around 5% of the overall national power demand. So if we then think about taking that a stage further and combining air separation unit systems with liquid air energy storage, that could be used to again offer uh, grid stability um, services and also to, to, to move into longer term energy storage systems. We could also think about implementing a demand side reduction in air separation units linked to industrial processes to again help um, achieve stable grids. And those similar control systems um, can be used to manage the, um, the demand of the different product from an air separation unit. So think about liquid and gaseous products across the range of different um, gases to, to, manage, to, to manage energy demand. And also to, to, to develop digital twins, which can then further improve uh, the efficiency of cryogenic air separation units. The next area I want to look at is non-cryogenic air separation units. So here there are a number of Competing, to, uh, competing technologies, as I show in this um, table, over a range of technology readiness levels. So things like adsorption technologies um, are available commercially already. Some of the membrane technologies are being developed and newer technologies like um, chemical looping can offer relatively low um, specific power consumption compared with um, cryogenic systems. So for the next chart, I'll the next few slides, I'll take a look at some of the technologies which I think um, could be important um, over the coming years. Adsorption is the first of those those technologies, um, and adsorption can include pressure swing absorption vacuum swing absorption, vacuum pressure swing absorption, and temperature swing absorption. And these are all quite similar in that they use a range of adsorbents um, like alumina, activated carbon, and molecular sieves. They typically um, use those in, in two, um, two beds, as shown here. With the first bed um, absorbing um, typically nitrogen, and then the second bed um, being used for, for desorption of the, um, the captured nitrogen by passing through um, a, a second gas to then um, carry out that desorption. 
In the case of pressure swing absorption, that desorption step um, is carried out at, at lower pressure. So the adsorption at, at six bar pressure and desorption at ap atmospheric pressure. And similarly, um, that same process can happen in, in vacuum swing absorption, but at, at lower pressures and in temperature swing absorption, but here we use temperature swing rather than pressure swing. These can achieve um, the oxygen purity needed for oxyfuel app applications, but at typically 100 to 300 tons of oxygen per day. So around of order of magnitude below um, cryogenic separation processes. And as we think about increasing um, the, the amount of um, oxygen production, that typically uh, um, reduces the purity. So I think these kind of systems are, are commercially available, but not um, for oxyfuel applications, probably more for some of those different industrial applications where the amount of oxygen needed isn't quite so high. The second technology is, is membranes. So here we have things like um, polymeric membranes, which exploit the difference in, in oxygen and nitrogen diffusion rates. So here, um, nitrogen would pass through the membrane uh, and, and oxygen um, carry on flowing um, through the process. The typical levels of oxygen pur purity for this system are, are, are low maybe as low as 40%. So you, we tend to find these in, in multiple um, membrane steps. But there are opportunities to, to think about um, combining the, the, the membrane step with the kind of molecular sieves that I've just described as a hybrid mixed matrix membrane approach, uh, which could be a, a future direction for these kind of membranes. The second membrane approach is ion, transfer, ion transport membranes, which use a solid inorganic oxide ceramic material, which this time allows the oxygen ions to pass through. These potentially um, can achieve much higher oxygen purities. They operate at higher temperature, so 700 degrees C and above. So that allows the, the opportunity for thermal integration, again with the, the the kind of um, host power plant or industrial process. They're potentially economic, um, but there are <coughs> uh, materials development and durability issues which need, which need to be overcome. ITMs have been looked at um, up to about 10 years ago um, by companies like Linda, but it seems to have been parked uh, for the moment. So I guess that reflects the, the, the kind of materials and durability issues that still need to be addressed. Chemical looping is a, a, another approach for oxygen production. Um, here, air can be fed into one reactor um, where a, a metal oxide um, uh, is, is oxidized and the oxygen uh, could then be transported across to a, a second reactor uh, where the oxygen can be released um, within the, the process. Chemical looping offers potentially very low specific um, energy de demand as I, I showed in that earlier chart. But as with ITM, there are uh, issues um, relating to the, um, the materials of the oxygen carrier and the mechanical stability of the oxygen carrier and its transfer rates. Um, so this technology is still at relatively low TRL level and, and needs further development. Electrochem electrochemical oxygen is the, the final uh, technology I, I want to look at. So the, here we think about um, using ele electrolyzer technology based on alkaline, proton exchange exchange membrane or solid oxide electrolyzer cells. So it's very much like um, a fuel cell approach, um, but in reverse. So here we, we apply an electric current to separate water into um, oxygen and hydrogen. So this 
um, due to that, it can produce very high purities um, of oxygen, but typically using um, high, at high specific power consumptions and at relatively low oxygen production levels. So as a standalone technique, it's not one that I would recommend. But having said that, um, <clears throat> if we look at what's happening in terms of hydrogen production um, currently, and hydrogen targets. In Europe, there are already targets to have 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers in place by 2030. And if those electrolyzers co-produce oxygen fully, they could be producing 80 megatons of oxygen per year by 25th, sorry, by 2030. And if that same approach was rolled out to all uh, green hydrogen production systems, through to 2050, then there could be as much as you know thousands of tons of oxygen being produced by this approach. So I think oxygen as a co-valorized product with hydrogen pr production um, can be um, very important, and I, I see it becoming increasingly important through to 2050, particularly in applications um, of um, kind of industrial clusters where there's use for both oxygen and hydrogen um, and, and in hydrogen hubs. The next area I, I said I would look at is, is um, patent, a review of patent um, applications. So I, I made a search of um, the SPASnet patent database looking at air and separation and oxygen as terms. To narrow that down, I looked specifically at the last five years and to further narrow it down, eliminated applications which looked at oxygen for um, um, kind of medical applications. By doing that, I was able to get down to around um, 300 patents, which was um, kind of a, a manageable list. I think interestingly, 75% of the, the patents um, that I assessed are either filed primarily in China or have a lead Chinese organization. So this to me reflects the, the, the kind of significant importance of oxygen production in China. There were also a, a, a very large number of Chinese companies involved, but with typically low patents between them. So there are only a handful with, with five to seven patents um, to their name. So companies like uh, Kaifeng Deer, for example. So it's really Lindy and, and Air Liquid, um, still within Europe, that were leading the individual patent productions with 38 patents between them. Then think about the different types of um, air separation unit technologies that were being patented. It's still cryogenic AFUs that dominate. So around 60% of total patents assessed were of that cryogenic um, type of process. Uh, and as you can see from the chart here, it, it really dominates over the others. And something like 75% of those cryogenic patents related to performance and um, kind of system improvements. So again, that reflects the maturity of the cryogenic process. Absorption and, and membrane technologies, um, again, had about 30 to 40 patents between them. I was kind of surprised by the low level of patents, uh, which chemical looping and electrolysis had between them. So they all all of the new technologies accounted for less than 10% of, um, of file patents over the last five years. Heat integration was a, a key feature of the patents. So something like 20% of the patents um, related to the integration of ASU with power generation and industrial processes. And that was right across a range of the different air separation unit technology approaches. I was also interested to see um, that 
there was a number of tech a number of patents that looked to feet look to combine the different ASU approaches themselves. So looking to couple oxygen production from water electrolysis with a conventional cryogenic um, ASU approach. So the cryogenic approach providing the, the kind of base load oxygen production um, whilst um, <coughs> What's electrochem electrochemical oxygen um, produce the kind of variable demand to go along with that, and also approaches of combining things like membrane technologies with um, solid oxide technologies to use the, the the good features of both systems to achieve um, high oxygen purity and high oxygen flow, which neither of those techniques could achieve by themselves. So finally, to, to wrap up with some, some key messages. Industrial oxygen is clearly a, a key market globally. There are around 380 million tonnes of oxygen produced, corresponding to a market of around $50 billion, which is growing at, at 7 to 8%. Um, annual growth rate. It's the cryogenic ASU process which remains the preferred technology for producing that oxygen. It's because it's the, the most cost effective for producing high purity and high production rates um, of oxygen. And the specific energy demand for that oxygen is being driven down towards this medium term target of around 120 kilowatt hours per tonne of oxygen in octafuel applications. Heat integration um, is a, a, a key driver to achieve that, as well as oxygen purity and reducing that oxygen pur purity to, to around 95% um, levels. Competing technologies with that cryogenic approach includes chemical looping, so this offers the advantage of reduced energy demand, but there are still issues of um, um, durability and materials use for the oxygen carriers, which still need to be overcome. Electrochemical oxygen as a co-product with renewable hydrogen, I think is set to become increasingly significant through to 2050. And particularly in those kind of industrial clusters and hydrogen hubs where both the oxygen and the hydrogen um, could be used. And there seems to be good opportunities to use the air separation technologies themselves combined um, to you know, deliver better ASU systems at, at lower cost. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you for listening to me today. The report that this presentation is based on um, should be out for comment uh, within the coming uh, coming weeks, and I'm going to make available with that the um, the patent search that I did um, as a it's an, an Excel-based system which you can you can follow the links and 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 look at all the information in more detail. Okay, um, so that concludes my presentation. I'll just take a look to see if there are any any questions that I've I've been asked. Um, so the uh, I see a couple of questions from from Peter Peter Rennick. So he's, he's asked me, um, please could I comment on the use of cryogenic um, gaseous oxygen systems producing 93% purity oxygen, which I understand are more efficient than the classical uh, cryogenic ASU. So yes, um, as I. I Hopefully, as I described in the process, sorry, in, in the presentation, if we reduce the oxygen purity um, to 95% and below, 
so producing um, <clears throat> an, an oxygen um, oxygen product which still contains a, a large amount of argon, then the cost can be reduced um, quite significantly. So to, to 150 kilowatt hours per ton of oxygen um, and below. But it, it, it then transfers the, I suppose, the, the cost and optimization onto the, the central processing unit within the um, within the air separation unit combined with um, the oxyfuel process. And lastly, to comment on chemical looping. So chemical looping continues to attract R&D dollars despite the technical and mechanical problems. So that's not clear why. So I, I think um, chemical looping does offer the, the significant advantage of, of lower cost of oxygen production. There are clearly good opportunities to integrate the, the chemical looping process within an overall power plant or industrial process. So I think those are the, the advantages that are, are driving it still being looked at. Um, and there are some projects that, that um, the US DOE has funded recently, um, some of which um, address chemical looping. So the, there are clear advantages to it, but it's, it's those mechanical and durability issues, as, as you point out, which, um, which still need to be overcome. Okay, so that, that seems to be the only questions at the moment. Um, if anyone else has questions they'd like to ask me, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to address them offline. So that concludes things today. I'll, I'll just hand back to um, Benedicta to, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, and all that's left for me to say is the slides from this webinar will be available to download from the webinar page shortly. Thank you all for joining us today and goodbye.